Hello and welcome to episode 133 of Ready to Mosh. I'm Gem G and with me as always, the pop to my corn, Mr. Kev B. Uh, more topical. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, it is about one of the things. Well, yes, kind of. There's a tenuous link in there, isn't there? There is. So today is our April roundup. How that's got here, I don't know, but it is. So yeah, we're looking back on some news from the month of April, including podcast news, and then we have got some things to review. Yeah, quite a few bits. As always with our news roundups, some of this may seem a little bit old news now, but it happened in April, so we're going to include it and our thoughts on the happenings that have been announced. So first thing is Bloodstock have announced a new early entry access, which they've never done before. So that's a new bit. And they've put a load of new additions on, including Acid Age, who are opening the Sophie stage on Thursday. Yeah, the early entry, I think, is it from Wednesday? I want to say lunchtime. can't remember now. I can't. It's been that long since I've looked at it. I can't remember when it is. Pretty sure it's Wednesday lunchtime or afternoon. I think it's an extra £20. Yeah. Bit of a similar setup to what Leeds and I assume Redden, because they tend to mirror, where you can get an early entry on the Wednesday as an add-on. Yeah, it's an interesting thing to do, and it might it'd be interesting to see if it cuts down any of the queuing types of people. Yeah, and it's also interesting. There was quite a mixed response to it from what I saw in comments and stuff. Like some people thought it was a great idea, get there early, they get a whole like extra day of festival. Obviously, mm-hmm. get better choice of tent pictures, and I think they're putting a bit of entertainment on in the campsites. I don't think the actual arena is open on the Wednesday. No, I don't think that opens till Thursday, does it? No. But then there were some people obviously complaining it's an extra cost and it's not fair because they can't get the extra time off work to go on the Wednesday. So they feel a bit hard done by and disadvantaged because of that. So Yeah, but they can't make, they can't make a change to satisfy everybody's exactly. needs. It's impossible. You're not a jar of Nutella people. But yeah, I think it's quite a good idea. It makes sense to try and cut down some of the traffic because... With yeah. only having the one day, most people are going to get there on the Thursday if they can, can't they? So, and with, as we know, it's quite narrow country lanes, sort mm-hmm. of the way into Bloodstock. So, definitely a bonus. Anything they can do to help. They've obviously listened to some feedback and thought, kind of took that on board. And yeah, the thing it. is, a lot. I bet a lot of people will be complaining. You know, it's an extra cost, etc. But they've got to put on an extra day, in a sense. They've still got their own costs to cover. Yeah, they're still going to have to get extra staff and security and yeah. all of that to make this happen. So, you know, it's got to have a cost somewhere. And I think £20 as well, I'm sure it was, 20 or 25 is a bargain, really, yeah. if, you, if you can do it and you can get the time off. Moving on then, so we have a genuine reasons for Gem to mention Ghost in this episode. <laughs> Not just sneaking it in there, so that will be in the podcast roundup. Yeah, they've announced, actually at the start of the month, this was just going to be that they released i think it was about a 30 second trailer or something for the ghost movie or goofy if you will i have no idea i remember you telling me about it and being really excited yeah and i just kind of wiped it from my mind surely you must be a little bit excited not particularly um you're not telling one of them are you well ghost or metal so i'm not listening to them no i've just got no interest in that I'm joking. Anyway, and um, today, just a few hours ago, they've actually announced the dates that the ghost movie will be shown all across the globe, allegedly, and that is the 20th and 22nd of June. But as of yet, we don't know where it's going to be. So it's going to be in cinemas on those dates, and tickets go on sale on the 9th of May, or pre-sales 9th of May. So I've signed up, obviously, for the mailing list for that. Annoyingly, the 22nd of June is Foo Fighters Day. So if it's on the 22nd, you probably won't get to see it anyway. No. Do I forgo Dave Grohl for <laughs> the ghost movie? The third well, I'm, well, I'm going to go and see the Foo uh, Fighters. So. Yeah, obviously the Thursday will depend on location. Yeah. As in if they show it in Nottingham, could probably make that. But if the nearest one's Sheffield or Birmingham, bit tricky. I don't understand why they've shown it on the 20th or 22nd. Why would they not just do a run of it? I don't know. I mean, I was looking at the Electric Cowboy cinema thing that they did a few days ago, I think it was, end of April. And that was literally on one date in the uk and i think there were about 10 at least different locations that it was shown at yeah i I just find it really weird that they're they're not doing like a run of it unless they're planning on some kind of special release on a streaming channel at some point i think it's to make it more of an event as well almost like a live show because i know people are on about organizing meetups and dressing up for it and all of that and yeah for those that can't see 
is rolling his eyes. So I think that's when other bands have done similar things, it's generally been very limited on the days that they've done it on and fully expect it to be on a streaming service at some point after, hopefully with news of when the next album's going to be out because it's been over two years now and they won't go into all the intricacies and nerdery of what the poster <laughs> could be telling us. Maybe I'll do an offshoot for that. Yeah. <laughs> there are ghost podcasts out there if you want to listen to more detail. Other news, download have announced their day ticket release. They're on sale now at £125 each. Interesting that they put the price the same every single day. I'm pretty sure it used to vary. I thought that it Friday used to, used to be cheaper because there were less there bands. Less bands and it starts later. And I know that Guns N' Roses Day... Was more expensive. Because... It's Guns N' Roses. Yeah. You had a three-hour headliner on that day. But, yeah, flat rate across the board for this lot. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, the prices have, you know, steadily increased every year. I think even if you're going for a day, £125 is actually really good. If even it, if even if it's the Friday, if there's bands there you want to see, you know, the headline acts are going to be like 50, 60 anyway, just on their own. Exactly. If you've got a full day of bands that you can see and you're going to get there for the full day, then I think it's worth it. One thing that always, and well, doesn't affect me directly, but I find interesting is that car park tickets are the same for a weekend or a day. I think that's a bit harsh. Yeah. I don't get, that's, like you've got to pay £35 just to park for one day. Yeah, but I don't get that. If it's 35 for the weekend, would you not kind of put it at maybe like 15? Yeah, or even 20 maybe. I don't know. Don't get that one. That doesn't make sense. They've also announced some of the, well, pretty much all of the District X stuff. And that includes, although I won't be watching this, a DJ set by Charlie from Busted. Bowling for Super doing an acoustic set which I'm kind of quite tempted to watch. I think it depends on when it is, what time it is. Yeah, are they on the Sunday? I feel like they're playing their main set on the Sunday. Yes. So it could potentially be the Sunday night, a bit like it was. Was it last year on the Sunday, Benji, as in Skindred, did a DJ set? I'm sure he did, and we were like, oh, it's Sunday. Just want yeah, to just want to go to sleep. We've <laughs> got to get up in the morning and move. Yeah. Yeah, Rock Fit is going to be there. Obviously. See you there. And there's going to be a lot more acoustic sets apparently announced on each day. They're, yeah. they're classed as secret sets, but if you've got the app, then I'm pretty sure we were getting notifications every time. Yeah, yeah. I think they announced them in the morning or something. Or the, I don't know. Obviously, it depends if you've got a phone signal, because if you haven't, then it will be a secret, because you'll never know. Yeah, how the hell did we get a phone signal? It was a bit intermittent last year, I think. It varies depending on your network. And we generally didn't have too much of a problem compared to some people. It wasn't great, but we did have enough to be able to find each other. Yeah. I think the the only time I remember it really being an issue in recent memory was when Guns N' Roses outlined. Oh, yeah, and we lost each other. Because that was just impossible. Actually, we didn't lose each other, but we couldn't find each other. Yeah. Yeah, that was the worst, so... But last year... There were more people there, and it didn't seem as bad. You'd like to think they'd put more, whatever you call it, you know, transponsters, my favourite word. What? Anything technical, the transponder. Okay. Um, but I do know some people didn't have any signal all weekend and really? stuff on different networks. Which is kind of weird because they, well, even if you're on a smaller network, it piggybacks off a bigger network. Mm, yeah, I, I don't know. That's yeah. just what I remember reading at the time. Kind of got a sidetrack there, just Completely a random... tangented, but yeah. yeah. And yeah, obviously there's loads more announced on that, but we're going to talk about that in more detail and our thoughts of what we may or may not look at. I mean, actually do our download proper preview episode. Oh, actually, there's one other I've remembered. I think... One in Colombo. One more thing. Those damn crows are doing... Are they doing an acoustic or is it a DJ set? I feel like it's a DJ one that they're doing. I know they're doing the podcast. Yeah, Crowcast. Yeah. Yeah, there's quite a few podcasts on there. Not us this time. But anyway, yeah, I just remembered that they were mentioned as some kind of evening entertainment. Moving on then. So I think this follows on from something that was a rumour in March's news, which was Slipknot's new drummer, and they kind of teased a little bit. But they have now done their first gig, and it is confirmed that it is indeed Eloy Casagrande, formerly of Sepultura. And they did a very tiny, I think it was like a 300 cap venue. There's their kind of launch show with him. Up like old school vibes. I yeah, I would it. love to. I'd love to be at one of those kind of mm. things. Yeah, where it's just such a small crowd because it's just going to be so intense. 
I can't even imagine Slipknot playing a show that small, small because they themselves would take up half the room, surely. Yeah. <laughs> With all their kit and personas. But yeah, that would have been cool to see. There is rumour of a Linkin Park reunion, but with a female vocalist. And apparently Rob and Joe might not be involved, so I don't know what they're going to do about the drums and the turntables and synths and stuff. But how do you feel about that? Not happy. And it's not because it's a female vocalist, I just feel like chest is irreplaceable. (laughs) It's had its place in history, it needs to stay there. Yeah, I know they have. Been bands who have replaced their lead singer and all of that. And I'm sure, DC, Queen. Exactly. We've waffled on before about this. Yeah. I'm sure, but no, I just know. So one of the rumours was Amy Lee. I think if it was her, I think it'd that work would better. work. I think it needs to be someone of that era to make it at least, you know, someone who was there with them kind of at that time, time when they came through, you know, if it had to happen. And... Um, I was trying to think kind of who there is of bands that's kind of big, but not sort of doing anything. Mm. I mean, what are Paramore doing there? They're still that, touring. They're still touring? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they've done something fairly recently, haven't they? I'd try and avoid all news of Paramore. Yeah, you just see them pop up and people get really excited about them, and I'm like, mm. it's the odd song maybe, but no. I just, can't, I just genuinely can't think of who they could get in. To be honest, apart from Amy Lee, I can't think who could do it. Who's really. a good fit. Yeah. Yeah, difficult. But no, I'm not up for that. You know, the precious entity that needs to be left as was. <laughs> Fair enough. Or as a one-off. Maybe as a one-off. Just like they did one show. Yeah. But to actually bring it back as a whole thing that tours. No. Finishing off then, there's been quite a few big tour announcements this month, including three that were announced all on the same day with tickets to go on sale around the same time and all playing in the same month, which is both rude and annoying. But they were Cradle of Filth, Miles Kennedy, doing his first solo tour since quite some time, I believe. Mm. He's not popped on the download lineup, has he, this year? Is he ill? I don't know. Is he, Corey, is he Corey Taylor's replacement when he inevitably drops out? He's doing something with Slash, isn't he, there on tour? I think they've just gone into Europe. Yeah. Anywho, aside, yeah, Miles Kennedy doing a solo tour, supported with a Devin Townsend acoustic set, mm. which I love the idea of, but I'm just, I have issues with acoustic sets because people won't shut up. Yeah, that I can, that would irritate the shit out of me because we've, we've experienced it first hand. But the other thing with the Devin Townsend one, how would a Devin Townsend acoustic set work? Because his stuff is very atmospheric. It's got such a soundscape. True, yeah, I'd not thought of it that way. I'd just, you know, like, you yeah. know, just like the different layers of stuff that he puts in it, I don't know how an acoustic set would work for that. Which makes it all the more curious to go to. Well, yeah. Potentially. And then the last one that was announced yesterday in this massive trio, Alien Ant Farm, supported by CKY. That sounds a great, great... I mean, all of these sound really good, to be honest. They do. And we've all got dates in Nottingham. So, yeah, we'll see when tickets go on. Mm-hmm. And... I think some of them are on school nights as well, as in late school nights as well. I think they're going to be very high prices as well, please. Mm. I mean, to be honest, probably one of the least I'm bothered about, potentially, is Cradle. Purely on the basis they were so good last time we saw them. You don't want to ruin that memory. You know, you want to hold that memory. And it was only a couple of years ago. And I've seen Miles in various guises, but never his actual solo stuff. Yeah, and I've always missed Devin Townsend. Mm. For whatever reason, I've always kind of always missed him at every festival or every show that he's done um but it, it's just the acoustic side of that that kind of puts me mm, off it yeah i know what you mean then alien ant farm i'm pretty sure i've not seen them i've never seen alien ant farm or cky you've seen cky have i you saw them with me at download did i yeah when the fuck was that i'm gonna say are they 2017 or 18 they were on the second stage and i want to say on friday but i could just be making that bit up but you've definitely seen them with me okay fair enough maybe i have seen <laughs> you have i just don't remember we could do an interlude and i can look the photos up. <laughs> <laughs> and a few other tours just to mention as well motionless in white earlier this month announced a tour which includes uk dates and i think that's in february next year yeah the top of my head. and i'm pretty sure that none of the dates work for us in terms of location and date which is a bit annoying but it's as it is i guess I feel like you were talking about them the other day. I probably was. And that you wanted to see them. 
and then that tour got announced and you went, oh, for fuck's sake. Something along those lines, I'm sure. And then Sleep Token have also announced a European tour with six dates in the UK, but I've got no idea when they are because you wrote that down. I did. Can you remember? No. <laughs> Prepared as always. <laughs> what are you here for? I do know that the Manchester one's at the Colt. Which actually officially opened about a week, two weeks ago. I didn't, though, did it? Because, mm. no, it went to shit. Did it? Oh, I missed that then. I just saw people being excited that it was open. And I hadn't realised it wasn't actually open, because I'd seen it on so many different listings and stuff. Yeah, they had to delay, I think, the well, they did the first kind of ticket thing, and they had to reduce the capacity. And then I think a Peter K show that was supposed to happen there got postponed. Oh, it did, because he wasn't very well. No, it was because the arena wasn't ready. But I thought he'd cancelled as well because he wasn't well on some other dates. Oh, I don't know about that. Um, but yeah, the, the arena wasn't ready at all. Oh, well, that's breaking news to me. Oh. <laughs> to add it in. Fair enough. Absolute tangent to end the news segment yeah. in. And yeah, just back to those sleep token dates. I'm sure if you're bothered, you'll know about them. <laughs> <laughs> Podcast roundup time then. Gigs and or festivals attended. Two together. No, one together which was Washing the Reef on Fest, which you should have listened to our review of by now and seen them photos and all of that. And what seems a very long time ago, I went to Blind Channel. That does seem a long time ago. It's forever ago. But yeah, and that's also got its review out and some very distant photos and videos. But yeah, gigs or festivals booked and or confirmed one, I believe. We have officially got our rising press accreditation mm -hmm. so we'll see you all there at the end of may merch purchased none in my defense i think there's only much in the roof on and i just kept forgetting to pick merch up yes which i think we said in the review yeah did we i don't know i think we did i, I genuinely just kept forgetting to pick merch up so I'm, I'm sure i'll make up for that later in the year yeah and i didn't get anything at blind channel which you can hear about in the review not to want to repeat myself on that one yeah, I'm sure Bandcamp Friday is probably coming up, so might have a nose there. Might be an excuse. I think the other thing as well is because it was a fairly quiet month on the gig festival front and knowing how busy summer is, I was just trying to save up for when it does <laughs> get busy, if you know what yeah. I mean, being economical and all that. And reasons for Gem to Mention Ghost has already been covered and there is one legitimate one. And I think, as far as I know, there's no random chartings to <laughs> report on this one. No. Well, um, I'm aware of. But I think we're still big in France. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that, yeah. And Mexico. We have mm. a new listener in Mexico. So, yeah, that rounds up the news and the podcast roundup. Right, moving on to the reviews then. We've got three albums, two EPs and a single this month. And, well... You must just want to get a partridge in a pear tree. Oh, okay. And the first album is Cure by Error, who are a download, I believe, this year. They are indeed. They are on the Dogtooth stage on Sunday. So this is their sixth studio album. For some reason, they kind of passed me by in days of yore, I guess. Mm. So yeah, there's a bit of a back catalogue there that I'm not overly familiar with. Generally kind of metalcore, progressive metalcore, five-piece album, has 12 tracks. And yeah, where do you want to start? Opening track. Self-titled, uh, really like this. Uh, fantastic soundscape with lots of different pieces floating in and out. And it's kind of like Parkway meets Sleep Token in kind of like its approach and style. Yeah, I've got, as my first note against this track, Parkway vibes fill the opener. Okay. But yeah, I, I do like this track. This this is um, a really good one on there. Rumour of Light track two. This is one of my favourites. I thought it continues really well from the opener. And it reminded me a lot of kind of recent Architects. Mm. It had that kind of sound to it, which may be why I liked it so much. Love the way that the vocals blend in this one. I thought it works really well. And just kind of the bridge into the chorus bit with that really heavy backdrop. Yeah. Enjoyed that very much. So track five, Slow Sour Bleed. I prefer this to some of the other tracks before it. I feel like it kind of dropped off for me a little bit before, after the opener. And this has got a lot of kind of clean vocals with like an electronic backing sound. It was very Linkin Park in places. I don't know if you got that as well. 
I didn't get Linkin Park. I actually got kind of almost like Nine Inch Nails. I definitely didn't get that. <laughs> no. It's on it. I yeah. thought, what was The Hand That Feeds, that album? That was on, uh, it's the same album that Survivalism's on. Yeah, but that kind of album, The Synths with in teeth. That, With Teeth, yeah. It reminded me of that, the, with The Synth. Oh, okay. Mm. Yeah, I, I didn't get any of that at all. Like, it sounded kind of almost like a 90s new metal kind of synth to it. And hmm, that's interesting. It's not very often that we kind of have different, we, we both notice something, but it's different things to us. Can we just check that we're not getting, mi- or you're not getting mixed up? Because I thought that track four had some 90s vibes to it, and I thought this one was quite industrial. So I'm not sure we're talking about the same song. Or would it be the same difference? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Definitely got different ear thoughts on that one then. Mm. I think we can conclude. 100%. <laughs> I did think it was interesting, track six, Wish. It's got one of those little interludes that we've seen quite often recently. Yeah. Little kind of quirky. Not for any particular reason. It's almost like an extended intro into track seven. Yeah, but... I'm still kind of hit and miss about them. I think unless it's something that you do, I don't really see a point to it. Because to be honest, unless you're actually looking at the track list and I'm watching it tick over to the next one, yeah. you probably won't notice it's a separate track. Yeah. So you almost think, what's the point of that? Because if you're just out and about listening to it or whatever, you'll it will just blend. Mm. Just a little observation I wanted to make on that one. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned it because it just mm. irritated me that they'd done it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so the next track I want to mention as a favourite is track nine, Fall Backwards, Out of Heaven, which I think has got an awesome title, aside from yeah. the song itself. Again, I found this one quite industrial on the guitars. really picks up the pace after the last few tracks and slowed it down a little bit. Much heavier and really love the vocal on this, especially the sections where the, with the actual track title in them. Does that mm. make sense? Yes. I think that works really well. Yeah, I'm glad you said that, actually, because this is like the standout track for me. And I pre- like you said, it's kind of the, the vocals in it. I prefer the extreme vocals in this. And it kind of creates an atmosphere that the clean vocals don't provide through the rest of the album. And it just feels a lot heavier and darker, and I really prefer that. It's definitely the best track on there for me. And... It's like the clean vocals that go through the rest of the stuff. I'm just not a big fan of. Mm. I don't know what it is. There's something about it that it the it could be the note that it hits. It just doesn't doesn't work for me. But track nine because there's less of that. It mm. really works. Yeah, I definitely preferred the more gnarly tracks on the album overall. I also like track eleven, Pale Iris. I just love the ferocious speed on this one. It's quite bouncy with the sinks in it. Sinks, synths. <laughs> through the kitchen kitchen, or bathroom. <laughs> kitchen always and yeah i found this was quite mushugary at times mm. which i think is why i liked this one yeah particularly through the midsection you're really getting those kind of the prog element of their sound coming through on this so that was the last one that i really enjoyed so yeah overall i thought it was quite a good solid album i'm going to go back and listen to some of their back catalogue loads of kind of angry riff like i say i like, prefer the gnarlier ones I can see why they've got softer ones in there to break it up, but mm. I prefer the heavier heavy stuff. Store. And what were your overall thoughts? If you like Architects and Parkway, you might like it. I mean, I like Architects and Parkway, but it's the clean vocals that just, it just doesn't do it for me. And when there's little to none of those, I really enjoy that kind of stuff. So like, tra- like we said about track nine, and but I just found a lot of the tracks quite skippable. And what was your score on the door? At six. I gave it an eight. Oh, I'm surprised at that. Yeah. I you're, like looking back on my note. <laughs> you're questioning your own score now, aren't you? I think it's because the ones I like, I really like. Yeah. And it's not like massively dislike the others, or it might just be the order that I actually listen to them in after some other ones that we're going to talk about. Maybe I was just like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I think I'll probably stick with my eight when we do the old spreadsheet. Okay, it's just for you then. Yeah. Just to say as well, actually, first time I listened to it, I listened it through it kind of through my laptop and then I listened, re listened through my headphones and much preferred it. You should always listen. Don't listen through your laptop. Sometimes I have to while I'm working. <laughs> I always try and give a headphone listen as well. And yeah, I definitely appreciated it much more through headphones. Okay. 
Next one then is Korpiklani Rankarampu, which I'm very intrigued to hear your thoughts on. So yeah, out of the, all the albums that kind of came out, I wasn't sure whether we would go for this one because I know that you're not what I would call a fan of Korpiklani, whereas I am quite a fan of them. So. I'll tell you what, let, I'll let you talk through your bits. Okay. And then I'll come in at the end. So if you're not familiar with Korpiklani, they are a Finnish folk metal six-piece, and this is actually their 12th studio album. I'm a recent convert to their ways. I came across them through Rockfit, of course. Yeah. Because we have a routine to vodka a few years ago. Uh, okay. Which I'm going to assume off the top of my head, I can't remember for definite, but I think it was probably from the World Metal Special. So I came across from that, and then I've obviously gone back and listened to it. I mean, they've got a huge back catalogue, obviously, with being their 12th album, going back to 2003. Oh. And these are at Bloodstock this year. On the Saturday, they'll be headlining the Sophie stage. So hoping I can stay awake for that one. Mm-hmm. Are you going to make me go through this because you want to hear my bad pronunciation? No, no, not at all. I, mean, no, I, I just want to know, I want to know your kind of like stand out. Yeah. And... One thing I did know from the off, I guess, with this is, I think most of their previous albums have had at least one or two tracks with English titles. Okay. And there aren't any in this one, which I thought was interesting. So the first one that I particularly liked is... And apologies if my pronunciation is completely wrong with this, because you know I can't pronounce English words at best times. Tapa Sen Kin Kirkit, track two, if you will. I enjoyed this. I thought it was slower pace than the opener, which really kicked off the album. I like the kind of changes of tempo in this. There's some great guitars in it, and particularly preferred the chuggier parts, kind of the midsection. It's a really good stompy one. Mm. You're going to probably notice that a lot of my thoughts are similar because... To be honest, it, they are quite similar tracks. I yeah, think. they are. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of, yeah. <laughs> so I've only actually got three that particularly stood out for that reason. Although I did like track three. I've not noticed it, noted it as a favourite. But again, this is another very traditional intro, very fist pumping, very catchy, very stompy. You know the drill. Mm-hmm. My favourite track is number five, Metan. I really love the guitars in this one. I think this is probably the most metal track on the album i think yeah safe to say i really like the kind of the melodic vocal section in the middle it's got quite a classic riff which almost reminded me i think kind of judas priest that kind of 80s classic metal guitar work power metal power metal yeah because you all know i love a bit of power metal too and track nine v catalentu this again was a slower track but one thing I noted on this in particular, I can imagine this one being a Eurovision track. It just had that kind of quirk to it. Mm. You know, when you get those acts on Eurovision that do kind of a folky type thing, I could see this working on there. don't know how it would fare, but I think it would fit in. And final track that I really liked was track 10, Naus. This one was really chanty, quite a mid-tempo compared to the other one. It's got a, I think it's a fiddle breakdown. That's a weird of phrase course. to say. <laughs> Things I never thought I'd ever hear doing this. Fiddle breakdown. Yes, a fiddly breakdown. <laughs> and again, another great one for like a drinking chant. You can see your fist pumping and mm. all of that. Yeah, I just generally enjoyed it as a whole album. It all kind of blends into one, but in a good way. And I can just imagine sitting on the grass, having a drink to it, or dancing around, doing a little like hobbit dance. That kind of thing. Right. Going through the Shire. That's what, what it conjures up in my head when I listen to Corpi Clarny. And yeah, it just makes me want to drink mead, even though I don't really drink mead because I don't like honey. But that, what it what it gives me. It's catchy, it's fun, it's bouncy, it's joyful. It's, how can you not like it? Let's find out. <laughs> it's fucking terrible. I didn't expect it to be that bad. <laughs> it is the worst thing I've ever heard. That is not true, surely. It, oh, it is. Okay. It's, uh, I just don't get it. I really, really detest this kind of thing. It's just joke, kind of joke metal. I just, no. You you talk about a fiddle breakdown. I want to break fiddles over the fucking heads. It's just but it's horrible. Their traditional music where they come from into metal, so. But it just feels like joke metal. Mm. It's not like when, if you think of, you know, Brazilian bands that blended music into metal or Spanish bands that have done it. Mm. It feels, you know, 
obviously Scandinavian, a lot of Scandinavian bands, it feels right and I like it. And this, I just hate it. I just, oh. Right, I'm, gonna I'm, take... I'm getting angry thinking about this fucking album. <laughs> I'm going to take this as a challenge to pick out some other Corpy Clarny tracks that I think you might get on with a little bit better. Okay. Before Blood Stop. Okay. Do I need to ask what you gave it out of 10? I gave it zero. Wow. The lowest score I've ever given anything. Lower than Bill Velo. Yeah. It makes Bill Velo's album look a masterpiece. Am I starting to detect that you just don't like Finnish bands or Finnish people? Because <laughs> you're not a massive fan of Blind Channel. And so we are now looking up other bands from Finland because I'm basing this on three so far that I know you definitely don't like. So pick out some that you do like to prove you're not an anti Finn. Uh, children and Bodum. Love Children and Bodum. Lordy? No. Hanoi Rocks. So there's a couple there. To be fair, there's someone there that I'm not aware of, familiar with, so I feel like we should do a Finnish special and we should find some new Finnish bands and see how you get on. Beast in Black, you won't like them. Okay. Trust me, you won't. <laughs> I know you, you won't. But yeah, the, you know, there is at least a couple on there that I know that I do like. Okay, then we won't cast you as a full-on anti-Finn. <laughs> Anti-Finn, yeah. Children and Bodum. I used to love Children and Bodum. Used to play their stuff all the time. So we know it's nothing to do with Finland. Okay. But these are the Cop Clarny are horrible. I mean, to be fair, I did try and warn you that, you know, it might not go well in terms of you reviewing it, but I didn't think it was going to be that bad. Neither did I. <laughs> what my review was. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Shall we move on? Let's move on. Next band and album up is The Ghost Inside with Searching for Solace. Yeah, this is another, similar to Error, sixth studio album. Mm -hmm. And we're back on those metalcore vibes. Yeah. After the folkcore vibes. First album since 2020. And these are at Slam Dunk this year. A few bands that I would be interested in seeing there. Because I'm still having a bit of regret over that decision to not watch them at Download 22. What was that, 22? Because I remember I went to go and watch them. And they you were did. amazing. I know. And I watched Frank Carter for the umpteenth time. Yeah, don't get that. Part of the reason was, by the time I thought, actually, maybe I will go and watch them, where I was stood, it just felt like too much hard work to get to the avalanche. Yeah. I think it was like, it had been the first full day of music, so it was on the Friday. Yeah. Like, first full actual download for, obviously, a few years, and I was just feeling a bit overpeopled, and I just looked at all the people I'd got to get through to get there, and I was like... I'm Not at me. <laughs> just watch Frank again. Okay. And I think they've recently toured in the UK, haven't they? I'm sure mm. they have, which there was a good reason we didn't go to one day. So first track is Going Under, and it seems to take a while for this to kind of get going. And then about halfway through, it kind of really comes into its own and turns out into quite a good opener. I thought it was an okay opener. It sets the scene for the album, but I did find that the chorus sounded a little bit boy bandy. Really? Mm. Oh, that's interesting. I'll have to give that another listen. I, I didn't get that at all. And it's not that I'm averse to that kind of sound, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> With the old Backstreet Boys of Metal going back to Finland. Yeah. But yeah, it, it wasn't definitely wasn't a highlight for me. Oh, okay. Fair enough. But I did like track two, Death Grip. I found this one to be a lot more visceral on the vocals. I really like the intro notes going into it. Got a lot of industrial guitars and beats from this. It reminded me of Static X at times. Mm. And probably say this is my favourite one on the album. Okay, interesting. It, it wasn't really a kind of a standout for me, that. The next track that I do like is called Light Years, which is track three. Feels like a kind of a stadium festival sort of anthem. And a lot of the tracks do on this album have that kind of feel to it. But this is one I can kind of see really working at download. Love the vocals in this and the kind of mix with the and the mix with some interesting synth and guitar layered through it. I just thought that one was okay. It was quite so it's okay. <laughs> classic metalcore kind of sound. Yeah. It was all right. I uh, also liked track four, Secret, which kind of did feel like a bit of a throwback to kind of like early metalcore. I found that one, my note says, to be over melodic. Oh, I thought it worked really well. Um, the only thing I did think about it is that some of the vocals are a bit whiny mm. in that one, but I still liked the track. It was kind of like it was on that border of being whiny and irritating, but not too much to, to mess the track up. 
That's a perfect backhanded compliment, I think. What? What you just said. Uh, okay. I can just see that on a little, like, album note or review <laughs> note. <laughs> on the verge of whiny, but not to be irritated. <laughs> <laughs> Next one I liked was number five, Split, which was another more visceral, heavier one. Really like the guitars in this one. It's got a really good breakdown in it. The vocals were harsher. It's got a good chorus. I like the kind of the chant a vicious cycle in it and i think this would work really well live i can see it being played with fist pumps in the air yeah okay I, can i in my notes i like i actually really like track six wash it away then it in my first lies after the last heavier track mm. which is split that this felt like a lighter kind of offering mm. with quite a pop feeling places but it's one that I'd really like to see live. And it's another, for me, it was another track that had some good use of kind of synths and guitars layered on it. I feel like we're alternating in the ones that we like and we're taking a very different opinion on We are, that. yeah. Because all I put next to Wash It Away is, ironically, quite washy. Oh, <laughs> fair enough. And just today, I did listen to this purely from the start on headphones. Okay. So I've had the full experience. Ear experience. Yeah. Next one I liked very much was number eight earn it mm -hmm. i thought the kind of previous ones had lightened off a bit so this smashes back in heavily again again i really like the breakdown in this one it's got a really catchy chorus that works really well yeah see i'm quite surprised by that because i found eight and nine quite skippable okay so yeah track nine is the last one that i've noted as really liking <laughs> really love the intro into this one it's got really vicious lyrics it's nice and bouncy Again, the vocals are more vicious in this one. I love the way the tempo's change and it's got a really gnarly breakdown that I really just want to, you know. We are so split on this album because <laughs> track 10 is my favourite. I feel like that's the standout track of the album. And I'm surprised it wasn't more like this because this feels more like The Ghost Inside than the rest of the album. And I love the build-up to it and the chorus. And it just felt like a Ghost, in Ghost Inside song, whereas everything else didn't as much. I just put that one was okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, there's a slam if ever I've heard one. It's okay. Yeah. But then track 11 is kind of like another, for me, another festival anthem. And you can see them finishing with this at shows. And moves into a strong chorus with a slower ending and quite a good way to finish the album off for me. I mean, I didn't particularly like this one again. I thought the chorus was quite boy bandy. And I think if you kind of isolate that, and particularly the way it ends, it almost sounded like a Eurovision track. Which means you should like which it. Which means I should like it. But in the context of a Ghost Inside album, I didn't, if you know what I mean, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. Very split on this, aren't we? We are. The most splittiest ever, quite possibly. Apart from the obvious yeah, extremes. Yeah, the extremes, yeah. But yeah, I just think it's really funny how we alternated which tracks we liked. But the way they've kind of changed some of the style and the things they do, it's not one of my favourites. Yeah, I mean, I just thought... It was pretty average overall, and like you said, not one of my favourite Ghost Inside albums. I know that they tend to be more on the melodic side of metalcore, but this was just too, Bit too kind much of there. melodic and soft. And there's a few good tracks, and similar to the Era album, I like the heavier, gnarlier ones mm. overall. But some are just skippable, and it just seemed quite generic at times. Mm. So what did you give it out of ten? Six and a half. I gave it seven and a half. So I slightly liked it more than you. Moving on then, so we've got two EPs that we're going to review now, both former guests on the podcast, and these are Wargrave and Godda. So go a few episodes back and listen to those interviews if you haven't already. And for some unknown reason to even my own brain, when I've marked these EPs, I've marked these out of five instead of ten, and I don't know if it's because they're oh. shorter. <laughs> I was just looking at it. I think it's because my brain thinks it's a shorter, I shorter. What do you call it? Entity, smaller entity. So it's out of five, not ten. Fuck's sake! Welcome to my brain. Yeah. So I'm going to convert it at the end. <laughs> okay. Anyway, we'll start with Wargrave, and this is their self-titled debut ep and if you're not familiar with wargrave they're kind of a thrash stroke classic metal band yeah thrash speed metal yeah mixtures of kind of classic metal in there too and also in another twist of brain workings 
I've got mine in slightly the wrong order because I thought I clicked on the EP, but I hadn't. I'd just clicked on Wargrave as an artist to listen, and I didn't think the order was right when I actually came to write in my notes. So. Right, okay. This is going well. Yeah. We should still start it in the order that the EP's listed in. I know, I fully... And what I mean is, I've just got to... <laughs> I, I know what you mean. I'm... I've renumbered it, so we're going to do the EP in order. Yeah, yeah I know what you mean. I'm yeah. just saying it's... <laughs> Only you could do that. Yes. So, it's five tracks... And the opener is War Graves, which is one of the singles released. Mm -hmm. And I just love this song since I first heard it, really. Yeah, yeah. It's a great mix of speed through it. And it just mixes everything in so well, like the drumming, the kind of fades in and out, the that epic guitar solo halfway through. Yeah. Yeah, one, <laughs> one of my favourite tracks on the EP list. Yeah, from the great drum intro that it's got into that classic speed riffage. And, but I love when it slows down as well. It's almost like a track of two halves. It's got some great harmonies on it. And it's definitely an earworm. It gets stuck yeah. in your ears all day. And I can just imagine, I mean, I know we have seen it live, but I mean, like on a bigger stage, you know, those like the woe woes of yeah. what of putting it better. Yeah. You can just imagine those in a bigger crowd mm. being sung along. Perfect opener. And it's got an excellent video as well, as also discussed in our interview. Track two, Enchained. First thing I want to say, how the hell does Roman hit the high notes in this? I have no idea. They're fucking unbelievable. <laughs> they are ridiculously high. Yeah. And I thought this actually started slower than I would have expected. Mm. But then kind of like midpoint, it really kicks in. Yeah, it's really fast as you get through it. Yeah. And it's really interesting as well how they mix all the styles again in this. Mm. There's so many different things going off through one track that I just kind of wasn't expecting at all. Yeah, I said it's a perfect mix of traditional thrash, and then you've got those driving drums throughout it. Awesome guitars, which is just kind of a signature of all tracks, really. Really reminds me of kind of early Maiden, this one. Yeah. You can see kind of those influences. It kind of feels timeless, if you know what I mean. It could fit yeah. in in the 80s, but it's but not it's out still of place relevant now. now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Track three, then, is Witch. Which is another, well, I say it's another of my favourites. I've marked two as favourites, but I think they're just because they were the singles and I'm more familiar with them. Mm -hmm. But it opens with a classic vocal shriek, loads of excellent guitar work and solos again in this one. It's a really catchy earworm chorus and kind of just the music and the pace, it just blends with the story of the song. It yeah. just works really well. Yeah, I also found it kind of tough to choose a favourite, but this is definitely a contender. Uh, love the groove parts in this and yeah the bit with tim owens it's almost like a dual vocal standoff yeah if you know what i mean and it's an absolute standout track and it goes some more kind of excellent guitar pieces and rhythm and drum layers everything's kind of really well balanced in this and it's a song that works with tim owens and without him mm. so when it's played live it doesn't feel like it's not a wargrave song it, yeah. it, it just feels kind of it, like it fits yeah and that's kind of what the band said when we spoke to them about it didn't they they kind of said it, yeah it's it works well without him there on the live stage it'd be great to see him at some point joining yeah, them on stage yeah, imagine that, yeah but yeah they kind of tell us the whole story about how they got him on the track and all of that in the interview so make sure you check that out because i just love that tale yeah track four revenge is near this feels like a harder darker sound to the other tracks yeah definitely and um, there's more emphasis on a faster sound. It's kind of really good to see that they can mix things up. So there's this going on, which is a bit of a contrast to like the earlier tracks. Yeah, I said it's different, but in a good way. Yeah. So it's got deeper vocals. It feels a bit more bassy, kind of sinister at times. And yeah. again, that tone mixes with the lyrics and the tale that they're telling. Yeah. It marries up absolutely perfectly. And then it's just an absolutely insane vocal to finish it off yeah. as well. And then final track, number five, Price to Pay. I love the really traditional feeling intro to this with like the twin guitars going. It just works so well. Yeah. And then you've got that classic gallopy riffage. Another great track. You can really feel those kind of influences from kind of Priest, Megadeth showing through in this one. And it's kind of, yeah, again, kind of crosses over the genres that they fit into. Yeah. I really like the kind of the way that it builds up, the groove builds up and the drums again. And like you said, like some of the solo bits as well, just absolutely epic the way that they kind of kick in. And 
it's the way that they fade in and out with Roman's vocals. So it's not like one thing takes full control. It's just, again, nicely balanced, nicely mixed. Mm. Yeah, very well structured, very well paced. And a good track to finish on. Yeah, I think overall it's kind of a, a perfect debut EP, really. It just, it's full of, as we've said, those kind of mixes of traditional metal, some thrash, some power metal. There's just great bass guitars, drums and vocals. It just works really well. And it also sounds great live, which we've seen a couple of times now. And also the way that each track tells a narrative, I love that they've got that twist on and each track features in the artwork of the EP, like it's a whole full perfect package. Yeah. And yeah, I just can't wait to hear when they get more release up to a full album. Yeah, couldn't have summarised that any better myself. Pretty much the same sort of thing I was thinking. Yeah, really well balanced, really well structured. Fantastic first release. And same as you, I'm looking forward to the newest stuff that they're working on as well now. So Mark's out of, are we going with 10? Well, I was, yes, yeah. Yes, okay. Uh, eight and a half. Okay, so my weird old brain gave it four and a half out of five, so I'm equating that to nine out of ten. Okay. Next EP up then is God of the Path of Destruction. Again, previous guests. I can't remember what episode, it wasn't that long ago though. It feels like ages ago, but I'm sure it was only last month. It was Released about a week before the EP was released. It was so episode it 129, so four episodes ago. And yeah, this is their second EP, but the first one with their current vocalist, Miles. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's something i kind of forgotten. I always see Miles as being there from the start, but he wasn't. Yeah, I think it's because when we first kind of found them, I think, did we do them as a recommendation or they sent yeah. them a single to review last year? And obviously Miles was there then, so we kind of have always just known Goddeth. With him as the vocalist. Yeah. Although I do like the stuff they did before that as well. Yeah. But kind of this is just how I see them. This is kind of like the, as we've known the lineup, this is what it is. And yeah, if you don't know them, they're a five piece kind of groove metal band, but they do kind of cross over a lot of genres in their music as well. They won Metal to the Masses Leeds last year and we saw them at Bloodstock. Yeah. So I can vouch that they are excellent live. I spoke to them at Bloodstock as well. We did, yeah. Track one then, Test My Resolve, um, shortest track on the album. It's just like a really punchy, straight to the point intro. Felt quite hardcore in terms of the vocals and the slow breakdowns. And yeah, really good introduction just to get the momentum going. Yeah, my first note is, Jesus, this is heavy. Yeah. <laughs> it's It reminds me of kind of like Slipknot when they first started. Mm, yeah. You know that pure, raw brutality? Yeah. And yeah, it's a real ear bleeder, this one. And I absolutely love this. This is a really good track. Yeah, one of my favourites. Yeah. We've not said actually it's six tracks for this one. Yes, it is. Yeah. Next up is Coup de Gras. More of the same intensity on this one. We spoke before with this about how much we like it. And I can see why this had a single and a video release. Because it's such a strong track. And it's kind of, it's a very standout kind of choice to pick for that. Yeah, definitely. I'd throw it. It's an absolute banger. I've loved it since I first heard it. It's got some great guitar work. It kind of twists to some industrial vibes at times. It's dark, broody, gnarly. Got the dark lyrics that really suit the tone of it. But then there's that little clean midsection that works really well. Nice and stompy and really catchy on the chorus. It's another one where it's just stuck in your head. It just gets there. For ages. It? Yeah, really love this track. Number three is Cartilage. More relentless guitars, loads of blasting drums, really heavy vocals, and yeah, just more of the same, really, just continuing in a good way. Yeah, I thought this was a slightly slower paced overall uh, to the previous two tracks, but it still kind of keeps the ferocity of the drums there, and like the guttural vocals throughout it are just insane. It's really work. Moving on to track four then, Solace. This the pace in this kind of picks back up again for me. And I love the subtle chord changes in this that just make the guitars kind of sink down. And that works really well alongside the vocals again. Possibly my favourite track, I'm going to say. Yeah, I've got this marked as a favourite as well. Again, I don't know if it's like previous with them, this being a single as Coup de Gras was as well, more familiar with it. Yeah, This was released... I think it was just before Bloodstock last year, so it's been around in my head a while. Yeah. You see, I'd kind of forgot about that. Oh, I do. Yeah. I completely, I sort of completely mm. 
blanked it when I came into listening to this and only kind of remembered Coup de Gras as a single. I think it's because it's quite because it's, it's quite a gap, wasn't quite it? Quite a gap, releases, yeah. yeah. But similar to what you said, it picks the pace back up again. It's got a really blasting intro. Loads of great grooves in this one. I love the bass line through it as well. Catchy, infectious melody. There's a classic breakdown. Great end. What more do you want? <laughs> Track five is Hatred. Love the intro to this one. Really cool bass line. Yeah. And then it's got really punchy kind of chord progressions through it. It's got some clean vocals in it, which gives it a bit of a different twist to some of the previous. And I feel like the vocals are kind of touching on kind of black and death metal as well. And then, yeah, I just summarised it as saying it's a chugging stompathon. Yeah, I thought this was slightly slower again. You know, track mm. three kind of slowed it down a little. I feel like that comes in again with this. Yeah, well, um, sorry. I say, yeah, with it being more stompy, that was kind yeah, of... Yeah, but it, it's kind of a more balanced approach through it. And it's... So it's almost like a extreme doom metal in places. Mm, yeah. It's got that really heavy kind of tone to it. And then... But a slower pace, just giving it that extra dimension. And then final track, Path of Destruction. I'll be honest, I was not expecting the vocal speed that starts this. Yeah. (laughs) Really did not see that coming. And it moves through varying speeds and intensities with drums, guitar, vocal battles. It's got everything going off in it. And they've really kind of, it's almost as if they've kind of built something up and then just let it loose for this final track. Yeah, it feels like the rest of the EP is kind of building up to this. I actually thought the kind of intro and kind of guitars towards the end had some Death Tones vibes to them. Okay. The way they played. But then in the kind of contrast, it also feels kind of darker and heavier than previous, which is hard to believe considering how heavy the other stuff is. Yeah. Um, and again, I've got quite a lot of kind of black and death metal vibes going through, which really kind of align with the dark personal lyrics that you see throughout the EP again as well. And that little spoken word word section really kind of does mix as well to it. So I think it's a really good track to end on. Interesting that like the self-titled one is ending it as well. Very often that's kind of the opener, isn't it? Yeah. Or it's somewhere in the middle and released as a mm, single. Yeah. And it's neither of those options. But it's almost like all the other tracks are kind of working their way along the path of destruction and that's it at the end. Yeah. If you know what I mean. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah, I really like this though. And it's good to kind of finally be able to review it, although we've had access for a while now. And yeah, absolutely love this. Really, really good. Yeah, I thought it was a good solid second EP. I really like every track on it. There's just so much going on, so many different kind of genres all blended into one. Just awesome selection of songs. What did you give it? I gave it eight and a half. I also gave it four and a half out of five, which again equates to nine out of ten. Yeah. (laughs) We're mathing tonight, people. Final review then, and we're finishing off with a single from Blacklight Vice, which is Locked In. Mm. So released a few days ago, this is very much a kind of heavy, kind of classic rock kind of vibe. Yeah, definitely. It's the it's the kind of sound that I think would actually do well at download this year. If you think that Dan, those damn crows are on main stage. Yeah, Florence Black on Florence back Black. stage, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's that kind of feel to it. Really, really strong vocals. I remember when I first listened to this, I had to kind of double check it was actually playing because it's very quiet for like the first three seconds. Yeah. And then and then you get the drums start to kick in. I was like, oh, all right, okay. See what they've done. Um, yeah, I absolutely love this. I mean, it's like you say, it's kind of like got a classic metal sort of vibe to it. Very, very good guitars. Really good vocals as well, actually. Really decent vocal range going. And yeah, I'd quite like to see this live. Yeah, same. I wrote similar. There's lots of cool riffs going through. Great vocals. It's just on that kind of sleazy edge of classic rock and roll yeah. that I really oh, like. That dirty. Yeah. So yeah, I thought it was a great track. Kind of a good classic tune. Some great solo going through the middle as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah, really enjoyed it. So make sure you go check that one out, as well as everything else that we have reviewed today. And as always, we'll be popping tracks from all of the things we've reviewed this month, as well as bands we've seen and bands we've spoken to on a playlist, which we will share in the next few days.
Well, we hope you enjoyed that episode. And don't forget to check out our socials. You can find us on Instagram, Threads, and X at Ready to Mosh Cast. We're also on Facebook, TikTok, and YouTube at Ready to Mosh. We've also got our Patreon as well that you can find there, which is just £3 a month, and you get access to all of the bloopers that don't make it into the show. You get early access to episodes where possible, and you can find out what we've got coming in May before anybody else. And finally, you can also support the podcast for free by giving us a five-star rating and a nice review on whichever platform you're listening to. And we'll be back soon with another episode. Me, Osh, Moog.